Hi, and welcome back. This time I'm going to shoot out Ableton Live's EQ8 plugin against Pro-Q3 from FabFilter. Of course, few EQ plugins can rival the FabFilter when it comes to features, and we'll take it as read that Pro-Q3 can do a ton of advanced stuff that's beyond the capabilities of any stock EQ plugin. I'm more interested in the basic EQ algorithms used. Are you sacrificing audible quality by sticking with the stock EQ instead of a third-party alternative? Or are all digital EQs essentially the same, as some people claim? I confess I'm not a live user, so I'm running the demo version. And despite what I've just said, let's start with a quick look through the features that are on offer. Here's how EQ8 opens by default, with four bands visible, including low and high shelving bands, and a couple of mid-peaking bands. Speaking as a long-time FabFilter user, I have to say this interface feels distressingly small. Fortunately, it didn't take me long to discover I could expand it. And this is much better. The graphic display no longer feels cramped, and it's nice to see controls for all eight bands laid out below. Though I confess the numbers still seem a bit small and hard to read to me. One of the first things I noticed is you can't use the mouse wheel to adjust the Q. This surprised me. I thought this was pretty standard for this style of EQ these days. But with a bit of experimenting, I discovered I could hold Alt and drag up and down instead. This isn't as good, in my opinion, but I guess I could get used to it. Speaking of Q, EQ8 comes with an adaptive Q option, which is on by default. This means the band gets narrower as you cut or boost further. And I'm happy with that for the mid-bands. It feels quite musical and useful. But it also affects the shelving bands. I'm not always going to want this, especially when cutting. So I'd probably turn it off most of the time. Annoyingly, as it's a global setting, this changes the shapes I've dialed in for the other bands. Pro-Q3 handles this rather differently. It's a per-band setting for a start, so pressing the little link button links the gain and Q parameters, and boosting or cutting deeper changes the actual Q parameter, so we see the knob move very slightly. By contrast, the Q parameter in EQ8 doesn't change, though the actual Q value under the hood obviously does. I'm therefore going to leave this option off when I start comparing with Pro-Q3, otherwise I won't know what the actual Q is. So I can turn the analyzer off if I want. And this is called audition mode. Every band I click on with this enabled gets soloed, so I can hear those frequencies in isolation. This is a nice touch, with one little quirk. If I select a band that's at unity gain, or close enough to unity gain, we don't hear anything. I guess we're actually hearing the delta difference signal. So you need some boost or cut, otherwise you just get silence. The equivalent feature in Pro-Q3 is accessed by pressing and holding the little headphones button for the band in question. And this simply switches in a filter, so you hear those frequencies even when the band is at unity gain. OK, what else? We've got stereo options. I can run a separate left and right mode. So this EQ now only affects the left channel.
and I can switch to get another eight independent bands for the right channel. Or I can run mid-side, so this EQ affects the middle of the mix, and I've got another eight bands for the sides. This is a powerful and flexible setup, but still not as flexible as Pro-Q3, which provides stereo placement options per band instead. EQ8 picked up some unexpected points when I realised I could lasso multiple bands and adjust them together. This is really useful. But notice that when I drag up or down to adjust the gain, both bands move together. So when I drag up, I get more boost and less cut, and vice versa. The FabFilter plugin handles this differently. Let's drag in a low shelf, and I'll double click to add a mid cut. Now if I select both bands together and drag to adjust the gain for the shelving band, the mid cut is scaled proportionally. This may be subjective, but the fab filter approach seems more logical and useful to me. Okay, finally we have an overall gain scaling parameter, which is useful to tame or exaggerate all your EQ settings, or even invert them and turn the cuts into boosts and vice versa. FabFilter's equivalent parameter allows you to scale all the gains from 0 to 200%, but doesn't allow you to go into negative values. On the other hand, I can achieve that in Pro-Q3 by selecting all the bands and adjusting all their gains together. But if I try to do the same in EQ8, that doesn't work at all. So let's get down to business. Do they sound different? I'm going to start with a null test. I've got a clip of pink noise on track one with an EQ8 inserted. And I've copied the same clip onto track two with Pro Q3 inserted. Pro-Q3 is set to invert the polarity. So when I turn on both tracks together, they cancel each other out. We can view the combined result on an analyzer. Here's the pink noise with only the first channel running. When I turn on both together, the combined signal drops right off the bottom of the graph, which is set to go right down to minus 100 dB. So let's turn on band one in EQ8, which is set to a high pass filter at 100 Hz with the default Q setting of 0.71. And we'll try to match that in Pro-Q3 to see if it still nulls. I'll create a high-pass filter. The default Q setting of 1 is different, but let's match the frequency first. And surprise, we've got a null already. And I haven't even matched the Q settings yet. Obviously these two plugins interpret Q differently, so a value of 1 in Pro-Q3 equates to 0.71 in EQ8. I don't know which is correct, nor do I really care, but it's useful to know there's a difference. OK, we're not finished with the high-pass filter yet, because EQ8 also provides a much steeper 48 dB per octave version. Over in Pro-Q3 we find many more slope options, which is actually a pretty significant advantage in my opinion. The 6, 18 and 24 dB per octave slopes are all really useful whereas I can't remember ever actually using 48 dB per octave. Nevertheless, it's a perfect null again, so we can conclude that, as long as you only use 12 or 48 dB slopes, there's no difference between the high-pass filters. So let's try a low shelf, 
still at 100 Hz, still with the default Q and a boost of 12 dB. And that nulls too. We're doing well so far. Let's stick with 100 Hz but try a bell instead. Not as good a null this time. However, I've not yet found any way to edit EQ8's parameters directly by typing in numeric values. I think the parameters have more resolution than the numbers on the interface, so sometimes they're very slightly off from the numbers displayed. With a bit of tweaking of ProQ3's parameters to match, we get a perfect null again. Let's try 1 kHz. And this is rather different. While it's still a deep enough null that I can barely hear it at normal monitor gain settings, it's clearly much less of a null than before, especially in the higher frequencies. I can try tweaking settings to match, but that's about as good as it gets. It's debatable whether this difference would ever be audible, but that there is a difference is not debatable. The null test proves it. And anyone who claims all digital EQs are identical needs to admit they're wrong now. You can do so in the comments below. Let's try 10k. And perhaps not surprisingly, the differences are pretty significant now. I can try tweaking settings. And I can shape the differences in various ways. but this is clearly not going to null. And we probably shouldn't expect it to, because if we look carefully at the EQ8 curve, we can see signs that it's starting to cramp out of shape. The cramping is way worse up at 20 kHz. Now the bell is obviously way too narrow. While the Pro-Q3 boost doesn't cramp at all. And the difference is now clearly audible with normal monitor gain. I found similar issues when I tested re-EQ, and I found that adjusting the bandwidth to compensate could reduce the differences significantly. But EQ8 offers a better solution. Let's go back to 10 kHz. And look here, EQ8 has an oversampling option. Notice what happens to the bell shape when I turn it on. Cramping gone. There's no cramping in Pro-Q3 regardless of the setting, but in zero latency mode there's a slight high frequency phase shift instead. If I switch to natural phase mode, that phase shift goes away and the null gets a lot better. Natural phase mode isn't oversampling. I know a few people are confused on that point. But it fixes the phase shift you get in zero latency mode, which brings the results closer to the ideal analog model. Oversampling in EQ8 dramatically reduces the cramping at high frequencies. As both EQs are now closer to the ideal model, they're also closer to each other and they null better. But there's still significant difference, no matter how I tweak the settings. And I can still hear this difference quite clearly without boosting up my monitor gain at all. So what conclusions can we draw from this? Those of you that watched my previous 3EQ video might have experienced slight deja vu when I was testing EQ8 without oversampling. Both EQs null with the fab filter at low frequencies, but not at high frequencies. And both exhibit remarkably similar cramping when we get close to half the sample rate. You might think that comparing EQ8 and re-EQ would be an interesting exercise. 
but actually I'm going to do a more fundamental comparison, one which gives me a great excuse for a trip down memory lane. Picture a much younger version of me, around the turn of the millennium, that really wanted a copy of Reactor. But I was struggling to justify the cost. So when I stumbled across shareware called Sync Modular, I immediately grabbed the demo. It allowed me to patch oscillators through filters, etc., with virtual patch cables, just like Reactor. I could create controls and arrange them on a front panel, just like Reactor. And it even ran as a VST plugin, albeit with a few quirks. So I was playing around with the demo, much as you see me here, when I was already sold on it, really, when something profound happened. I accidentally double-clicked on one of the stock filters, which I had assumed were fundamental building blocks, and it opened up. It took me a moment to realise that the filter wasn't a basic building block, but a macro container, and that I was now looking at the inner workings of the filter. In fact, almost all the DSP processing in Sync Modular was built like this, from just a handful of basic building blocks. And this made it much more than just a poor man's version of Reactor. While this may look a little daunting at first, looking closer we see that most of the modules in here just do simple arithmetic, like add, subtract or multiply. And we can simplify this further. By default this filter provides high pass, band pass and notch filters, as well as the low pass. Let's get rid of those extra outputs and delete the modules that are now orphaned and not patched anywhere. And we can also get rid of this section to the left, which just clips the frequency value so you don't accidentally modulate it too high and make the filter unstable. This looks a lot simpler now. And yes, this is still a two-pole resonant low-pass filter. And it still actually works. Oops, seems I tweaked it too high and it became unstable. So, okay, it's not the greatest filter ever made, but seeing it laid out like this was a big moment for me. The DSP behind filters and EQ had, up till then, just seemed like voodoo black magic. But suddenly this looked like something I could actually understand. Here we're dividing a constant, which looks like 2 times pi, by the system sample rate. These are the inputs for the audio input signal, and the frequency and Q control signals. I can't remember what that last one was for, we don't need that. And it's all really basic arithmetic, apart from these mysterious Z to the minus one modules, which turn out to be just single sample delays, so not so mysterious after all. So I went down a little rabbit hole, reading up on how filters work, and looking for more filter algorithms that I could try out in Sync Modular. And it didn't take me long to find the Robert Bristow Johnson cookbook. This defines a basic filter kernel with six input coefficients, plus formulae to calculate the coefficients for all the standard filter types, such as low pass, high pass, two flavours of band pass and a notch, and also including low and high shelves, plus a parametric midband. I'm not naturally gifted at maths. I barely scraped through an A-level many years ago. But with a bit of head scratching and perseverance, I did indeed manage to get these filters running in Sync Modular, as we see here. Later on, I also implemented these same filters in Synthedit and Synthmaker, and eventually, of course, Reactor as well. Incidentally, Sync Modular was too good to escape the notice of native instruments, who snapped up its creator, known as Dr. Sync, and set him to work on Reactor. The core cells that later appeared in Reactor allow you to drill right down into the raw DSP in a similar manner to Sync Modular, only with better control over the order in which things happen. And you can think of Reactor's core cells as a kind of Sync Modular version 2. 
Anyway, encouraged by my initial success, I tried to learn how to design my own filters, at which point I realised that my maths just wasn't going to cut it. I fundamentally don't understand it, and sometimes you need to just accept your limitations. But it seems I'm not alone, as lots of people use the RBJ algorithms, and you've probably used these filters in many different plugins without being aware of it. And they are really good. They're stable over a wide range of frequencies, unlike the native sync modular filter we looked at first. And they do exactly what they say on the tin, apart from one characteristic flaw. They cramp out of shape when they get close to Nyquist. And sure enough, I can get EQ8 to null with my reactor implementation of the Robert Bristow Johnson filters. With a little fine tuning of the values in my reactor patch, I can null the low shelf. And a mid bell at 100 hertz. and one kilohertz. And 10 kilohertz. and the high shelf. So I tweaked my reactor patch to use bandwidth instead of Q for the mid-bell, and slope for the shelves, as defined in the original RBJ cookbook. And it became trivially simple to null this against re-EQ. Now I'm not saying that EQ8 and re-EQ both use the Robert Bristow Johnson cookbook algorithms. I have no idea what's going on under the hood. But whatever algorithms they use, they appear to be based on the same underlying maths as they give identical results. This means that with EQ8 oversampling turned off, it's going to sound the same as re-EQ with equivalent settings. So I'm not going to bother comparing with Pro-Q3. Watch the re-EQ video, which I'll link to here, if you want blind tests of high-frequency boosts comparing Pro-Q3 with a Robert Bristow Johnson-style algorithm. What I'm really interested in now is the oversampling used in EQ8, which seems to fix the cramping without any negative side effects at all. Of course, I can't load EQ8 into Plugin Doctor, as it's only available inside Live but I can switch Plugin Doctor to external hardware mode and use loopback routing in my RME Total Mix software to patch it into live and back again. When I ping it to calculate the round trip latency, it comes up with a hefty 1100 samples, which seems to be four helpings of my buffer size plus another 76 samples for luck. Not sure why this value exactly. However, I discovered that if I delete the default effect sends and ping it again, it drops by eight samples. The frequency response shows a 2.5 dB drop in level, but I'm guessing that's due to the pan law. Sure enough, if I pan hard left or right, that channel ends up at unity. So I'll just compensate that with a bit of gain. Now let's see what happens to the frequency response if I turn on oversampling in EQ8. And nothing seems to change, which surprised me, as I was expecting to see anti-aliasing filters kick in. Let's look at a few other plugins for reference. Here's FabFilters Pro L2, which provides high-quality linear phase oversampling. 
When I enable it, we see a steep low-pass filter kick in above 20 kHz. Here's Slate's virtual mix rack with no modules loaded. I'll turn on oversampling. And there's the steep anti-aliasing filter again. Cytomics the glue. This one provides separate oversampling settings for real time and rendering. But Plugin Doctor runs it in offline mode, so it's the rendering setting I need to change. And again, there's the steep anti-aliasing filter at the top. But EQ8 doesn't show any visible anti-aliasing filter at all in this test. It's as if the oversampling isn't doing anything. Except we know that's not the case, as it dramatically reduced the cramping near Nyquist when we tested it earlier. So I'm going to cautiously conclude that this is some kind of special oversampling technique that I've not seen before. And let's check the phase. Just to be clear, EQ8 does analogue style minimum phase EQ. So if I boost a frequency, we see phase shifts either side of the boost. There's no linear phase option in EQ8. So what I'm testing here is just the phase shift caused by the oversampling. When I enable oversampling, we seem to get a load of severe phase shift. But hold your horses. Plugin Doctor has no idea if the latency has changed when it's not hosting the plugin it's testing. So we need to ping it again. And sure enough, it now measures 16 samples higher round trip latency. And the phase measures flat again. So I conclude that the oversampling is linear phase, which always inevitably means a bit of extra latency. In this case, 16 samples. The glue is also using linear phase oversampling, though this is optional. Two times oversampling results in 49 samples of latency. Virtual mix rack oversampling is also linear phase and helpfully reports its 63 samples of latency in the menu when you turn it on. And Pro C2's linear phase oversampling adds 34 samples of latency with its two times setting. So we seem to have a curious contradiction here. On the one hand, EQ8 appears to be using a standard RBJ style EQ algorithm. But on the other hand, it's equipped with oversampling that appears to be unusually good. It seems to somehow avoid needing a steep low pass filter just below Nyquist. And it manages to keep the phase linear with only half or even quarter of the latency of other plugins with linear phase oversampling. Two times oversampling doesn't entirely remove cramping when your project sample rate is 44.1 or 48 kHz. There'll be as much cramping at 20 kHz as there was previously at 10 kHz. But it's probably good enough to stop it mattering at all. ProQ3's natural phase mode is probably closer to the response of a perfect analog EQ. But the price you pay is 320 samples of latency. Of course, latency shouldn't matter in a pure mixing context, assuming plug-in delay compensation is working correctly. But Live has a particular focus on Live triggering, so perhaps the lower latency is a real advantage in that case. But if low latency is the priority, ProQ3 seems to be the clear winner, as it doesn't cramp at all, even in zero latency mode. I would have thought that any developer capable of implementing super high quality oversampling like EQ8 would also be capable of implementing decramped filters with zero latency. But what do I know? Anyway, the interesting comparison seems to me to be between EQ8 with oversampling on and ProQ3 in natural phase mode. And I'm going to try and devise a more realistic comparison. This drum loop was rendered with no EQ on any of the individual channels, so I'm going to dial in the kind of setting I might arrive at on a drum bus when using a top-down mixing approach. Let's take out some of that honky mid-range and add some low weight to the kick. And carve out some room for the bass part. The high frequencies are particularly interesting for this test. So I'll go to town with a high shelf boost set fairly low. Then a cut to tame the splashy part of the cymbals. A low pass filter at around 8 or 9 kilohertz.
And finally, a little peaking boost just below it for added sizzle. Now I'm going to turn on each band individually and null it as best I can against the corresponding band in Pro-Q3. I won't make you sit through that process. Now let's turn on all bands one by one and see if there are any extra differences that accumulate with multiple bands enabled. And they don't seem to be. The lower bands still cancel perfectly when all enabled together. While the higher bands fail to cancel, just as they did on their own. So if we listen to these individually, with Pro-Q3 flipped back in phase, can we hear any difference? Could you hear the difference? Which one did you prefer? As usual, the biggest takeaway for me is how much harder it becomes to hear the differences when you don't know which is which. I don't care how good your ears are, no one is immune to confirmation bias. However, in case you wondered, there was a good reason why I dialed in my drum loop EQ using EQ8 and then copied it to Pro Q3 rather than the other way around. It was just way easier to make the fine adjustments needed to find the null in Pro-Q3. Which reminds us that there are many good reasons to buy Pro-Q3 besides the basic sound quality. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.